I want to talk real quick. This is the third message for today, and I didn't think I was going to do another message, but uh, about your growth in the Christian life and how you know you're growing. The growth in the Christian life comes simply down to this. Are you growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that your understanding of the gospel is making you more and more bold towards God? That's it. Um, when you want to talk about growing in the Christian life, that's it. It's abiding in Christ. And John tells us how to abide. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will continue in the Father and the Son. It all You can't do anything apart from Christ. He's the one that bears the fruit. It's the life of the vine flowing through the branch. The branch's job is just to abide in the vine. And that is not a mystical thing. Like, if, you walk, if you're holy all day, then you really abided in him today. But tomorrow, if you sin, you're not abiding in him. No, abiding is related to the roots. Your roots growing into him. Being rooted and grounded in the faith. And the faith is knowing what he has done and provided for you based on his work that makes you safe before God. And you can know if you're growing in faith because your knowledge of the truth concerning what he's accomplished for you and brought you into is making you bold before God. And less and less sin conscious and less and less ashamed and less and less fearful and more desirous to know more of him. You know, the reason some people stop in their growth that they don't want to know him anymore and they get bored with the Bible and everything is actually at the root, I think, condemnation. They 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 think they don't want any more because it's still all reading like law to them, you know. And they don't they, when you say, I want to know God more, they look at that as a performance requirement. Oh, yeah. Well, I wish I was spiritual like that. I just don't, I'm not that spiritual. I don't feel like, I, I, you know. And they're condemning themselves and they think they're displeasing to God. So then that takes all the desire out, dries up the food, so to speak, uh, and makes it like, I, I'm not hungry for that at all. And now I'm feeling bad about it. <laughs> No, uh, but the gospel provides everything. The gospel heals it all. The gospel, you know, John Bunyan said, the law bids me to fly, but the gospel gives me wings. You know, if you're under the law, all you see is a demand. Well, you should love God. You should know God. You should seek to know him, and you don't even want to. You don't want to know him like that guy does. Look how much joy he has. What is wrong with you? It's all your performance, right? But the gospel comes and says, God reconciled us in Christ through the blood and those who are near and those who are far off have been reconciled. We who were far off were brought near by the blood of Christ. And God sent the shepherd to come and get the lost sheep. And he bore us on his shoulders and brought us home. And he went and got the prodigal and wrapped him with a coat and brought him into the house and gave him a feast. And you have peace with God now because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is for you and not against you. And if God doesn't condemn you, who is he that he will condemn if God justifies you and gave his only son for you? He's paid the price. He's reconciled you to himself. You are his possession his treasure, and you are an heir of God, and he is your father, and you have access to him, not on the basis of your performance, but based on the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can come forward boldly now, not because you desire to know him enough, not because you're more spiritual than you used to be, not because you're holier than you used to be, and you've gained more right into his presence, but because of faith in the blood. And so that means if for some reason the enemy deceived you and for the last five weeks you've been trudging through a pile of shame and thinking that you are 
no good, and you stopped reading your Bible, and you stopped wanting to listen to YouTube videos, and you stopped wanting to fellowship with anybody because all it did was reminded you of how unspiritual you are when you saw how happy they seem to be in the Lord. Uh, even if you've been doing that for five weeks, the gospel in this moment can bring you into the presence of God and say, you have everything. You're not lacking anything. You don't need to compare yourself to those people. They are justified by the blood the same way you are. And you know what? They may go through five weeks. Uh, the, you, you know, everybody who everything that comes up eventually goes down. You can see somebody that's really, you know, enjoying the Lord. They're going to go through a trial too. And then you're going to be the strong one praying for them. And guess what? They're probably praying for you right now. But what is their, what should their pray, prayer be? It should be, Lord, speak the gospel to him. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation, what is salvation? Salvation is the ability to live before God, naked and unashamed, bold and confident, knowing that he's for me, and there's nothing that separates me from the love of God which is in Christ, and I have access to his spirit now, and he's in me as a fountain of life, and I can drink freely, no matter what the last five weeks were like or the last five minutes were like. The blood is the only thing that can solve the problem. And once I realize that, and I exercise faith in the blood, and I am brought by my faith in the blood into the presence of God and renewed inside, and I feel his strengthening within, and the condemnation and the fear is broken off of me in that moment, and I've tasted that God is gracious, I've grown a little more. And now that is going to become a benchmark in my experience, a point of reference where I can remember, no, wait a second, the last time I got in this position of feeling like this, it, what was it that brought me out? Was it performance? Was it going to church more? Was it plugging into a Bible study? Was it reading the Bible more? No, it was being brought into contact with the gospel. Now, a lot of people don't realize that that's what revives them. And that's unfortunate because people teach them otherwise. And say, no, you got into that Bible study and that's, you had fellowship and that's why you felt better. Now you don't have fellowship. You're all alone. You're not in the Bible study anymore. <laughs> you know, I know people who do these five-week studies and when the, the study closes up and they're going to wait a few weeks until the next one, those people all dry up because they think that's their source. No. If they were in there and they got revived, it was because the gospel was present. And uh, it's the gospel that enlivens us. It's the gospel that gives us Christ. It's the gospel. It's Christ through the gospel giving life to us, giving his, himself as food and drink. And that's all we need is food and drink. We are to live by his supply through eating and drinking. My words are spirit and they are life. So the answer is always the gospel and growth in the Christian life just means you realize that, you know, growth means if you see me in condemnation today, you know that by the end of the today or tomorrow at the latest, I'm probably going to be out of it. And it's not going to be because I called my pastor or finally got to go to the Bible study or got to go to a worship service. But because at some point I turned my eyes off of my situation and my past and my performance and, the, and what I think I need and what I think I lack and put my attention by faith on the blood of Jesus Christ and exercised faith in the blood to come near to him and I got washed and revived. And I'm speaking from personal experience. The last day or two, for some reason this performance thing started kicking in in my mind and uh i just i couldn't get i couldn't break it i could not stop thinking about certain failures that in my life that have led me to certain certain consequences which are now the bed i'm lying in and yet it's a blessing but sometimes it doesn't feel like a blessing sometimes i'm reminded well you know if you'd have taken this other path <laughs> uh but our consequences are with us but we can rest in the gospel. David was a master at doing that. He knew how to accept consequences from the Lord as a discipline and yet still keep a, 
a heart after God's heart and know God was for him. He could accept judgments from the Lord and still rest in the grace of Christ. We usually can't. If something comes through our life, we think, oh, I was woe is me as I'm done, undone and God doesn't want anything to do with me. The only difference is that you know how to live by faith in the word. And that's what he's trying to train us to do. That's what he's teaching us. Sometimes he does bring us into an environment that seems adverse to all his promises. And yet the promise becomes, or the word becomes our power in our life, you know. That's growing. What is growing? Growing is growing your roots in the faith so that it takes you less and less time to get the guilties off and come back to the Lord. And it doesn't come through external means. Now, in this case, I actually did pr- ask a couple people for prayer. You know, just pray for me. I'm feeling really weird, you know. But, they're, and, I, and I appreciate their prayer. And I know I have a high priest praying for me in my weakness. And I know he will always bring me through. Now, that's a gospel growth thing in, in me. I knew I wasn't going to stay in this for the rest of my life. And I knew that the answer was going to be the contact with the gospel. And believing the gospel has brought me back, and I'm fine. And yes, it was their prayer. Yes, it was the work of the high priest. But eventually, that prayer is so that you would have contact with life, which is released through the gospel. That's what revives That's what renews. That's what washes every time. And a mature believer, the only difference between a mature believer and a so-called immature believer is that the mature believer knows where his food is. He knows where the source of life is. He knows how to use the gospel to bring bring himself into contact with, with the risen Christ. And if, and, and really we don't even know how to do that, honestly, uh, we know what we can say is that we know that that's what we need. When you are gripped with condemnation, your will, uh, your knowledge that the gospel is the answer doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be brought into contact with the gospel because your flesh doesn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> but that's where Christ comes in and intercedes. See, I, I can recognize that there's a cup of blessing, but I eventually realize that I can't even pick the cup up and drink. He's got to hold my head back and pour it in. We are a receivers, and he is the giver. And that is the position that the gospel puts us in. And it's the position of power in weakness. We are weak and he is strong. And that's how he wants it. Salvation is entirely of him, and it's his glory. So you may go through a five-week thing where you can't seem to figure out how to get to him just to give you a backdrop so that when he comes to you in the gospel, and it will be through the gospel, you'll go, wow, this is a lot different than the last five weeks because he's trying to set up a benchmark so that you'll remember, you know. Abraham had 13 years of silence with Ishmael before God visited him again with the promise, which was the gospel in his time. Uh, and the, what a contrast those 13 years must have been to God visiting him with the proclamation of the promise. Why? Well, that's God's discipline. God does discipline. And often he disciplines with silence. And when we are, when he is silent, we can often be feeling very weak and full of fear and second guessing and condemnation because that is our flesh. Okay. But he is waiting to be gracious to us so that he can show us the contrast so that we'll grow a little more and recognize. See, if God had just continued to visit him through that time, he may not have recognized that God's promise was really the source of his life. But if God gives you a big period of silence and then the gospel dawns on you, you know, and you're brought back, that is quite a contrast. And sometimes he has to set up that contrast. But during the times when you're feeling down, you should be clinging to the gospel as your hope. You know, I was feeling a little condemned and this actually started to swallow me up. It was like cumulative. First I was looking at this, then I was looking at that, and I was like, and I like this morning, I'm like, I have a carnal mind. I can't get my mind out of this frame, and now it's been two days, something's up, you know. But I know I've grown enough to know that I have a high priest who intercedes for me. 
and he will not leave or forsake me. He is my shepherd to bring me into glory. He is faithful. It didn't suddenly go back to works. <laughs> it is all of grace, and it's all of him. And what I need is life, and he is the life giver. And so I wait on him. At least I'm waiting on the right thing. And not try to look, you know, I'm not Googling churches near me, you know. Uh, so, praise God. And I see testimonies on my wall of people saying, you know, I used to deal with sin all the time and now I don't. That, they're not saying they're sinlessly perfect. They're saying that they're not swallowed up in condemnation because of sin. Now, sometimes something will grip you and you don't know exactly what's wrong. That's what happened to me the last day and a half. I think it was kind of like an attack where I just couldn't quite figure out what something wasn't right you know and then your mind starts to try to justify the feeling well it's because you're blah 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 you know but the answer is always the gospel i hope this is making sense to some people and to and for growth to know how much i'm growing all it means is how fast do i run to my source and how fixed am i that my source is my source so many people are running to and fro trying to get that feeling back they used to have whether they connect it to well i was in the worship service i was on worship team i was serving at church i was praying all the time and they try to revive some of those practices but now they find they have no strength to do it and they condemn themselves and the, it gives no life now what are they going to do well god's trying to get their attention and show them look it wasn't those practices you were actually believing the gospel <laughs> And you say, well, I believe the gospel. Jesus died for my sins. Yeah, the gospel is not just that he died for your sins. It's that he died for your sins according to the scriptures and rose from the dead according to the scriptures. And it's everything that the scriptures has to say about the implications of his death and resurrection for you and what all that brought to you. And that is a lifetime pursuit, even though our initial ignorant believing justifies us. And eventually it's the knowledge. It is being renewed in the knowledge of him and knowing who he is and what he's accomplished for you, that your roots are growing deeper and you can refer to him um, to be the, your salvation and the solution to your problems. That's Christian maturity. That's it. Now, sometimes you're in a fellowship with a group. It, how you view this will also determine how you fellowship people. Let's say you're in a group of people and somebody loses their appetite for the Lord. Okay. They just, they just, they're just not interested. And you can't fellowship about spiritual things right now. Are they a believer? Yeah. Okay, so they have the same provision you have. Do you keep coming at them? See, what most people will do at that point, see, because when you have no appetite for the Lord, eventually your flesh is going to break out a little bit. And you're going to probably say things you wouldn't say otherwise. And that's when the religious Christians judge you and stop fellowship, stop contact with you. Even, now, it's one thing if you are openly sinning and living in a rebellious lifestyle of sin that's so bad it's damaging the church like that brother in Corinth, and you're not working, and you're fornicating. And that, we're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who just kind of dries up a little bit, and they're a little coarser, but they're not interested in spiritual things. Do you just all back up and abandon them? No. You just keep going with them and talking with them because you know they have an advocate. You know they have a shepherd. And what you're looking for is not the cleaning up of their behavior to know if they're doing okay. What you're looking for is that day when they're refreshed and it will come. And one day, all of a sudden, they'll say, oh man, Christ is, you know, all of a sudden Christ is in their lips again. Something got resolved. But what if, it, what if the Christians abandoned you while you were in that? Every time I got into condemnation... And I didn't want to talk spir about spiritual things. I just kind of wanted to be left alone in that regard. All the Christians abandoned me because I wasn't as holy as they are. <laughs> you know? No. And this, this is how we know what to pray for people. Oh, I see someone who's losing their appetite. The root of that is probably some condemnation. And they're not really enjoying the gospel. And it could be God's bringing them through a season. And I'm going to walk with them through it. And my prayer is that the is that the Lord will revive them and bring them in contact with the gospel in a living way. I can't do that. You know, they know the gospel, so I don't need to just keep sharing it with them. They know who Christ is, but for whatever reason, God's got to bring them through weakness so that he can then wash over them, you know, with power. 
And, and when you realize that that is a legitimate part of the Christian life and how people grow, that God does deal with us in seasons, and sometimes we're in winter where there's not the foliage, but the roots are growing, we need to be able to bear with, that's what it means to bear one another's burdens. And I've seen so many people go through on YouTube here, somebody will go through a season and then some channel will start, <laughs> some channel owner will start judging that person and then start teaching legalistically. All of a sudden they go from being a supposed grace person to a legalist. And I know behind the scenes, because I know these people some of, in some cases, that they're really just offended about the spiritual condition of one person that they're, that's in their fellowship. And now they're teaching legalistically and bringing the whole community into bondage because of their judgment of that one person. And it's because of their own ignorance that they don't understand that the gospel is the power and that the Christian life has seasons. And they're revealing their ignorance, you know. But it's a really uh, distasteful thing to watch. It makes me mad. As when, especially when I know sometimes what's going on behind the scenes. You know, this person is offended by that person and is judging them because they're not spiritual enough for their tastes. And that they're so mad about it that they're going to launch, change their whole channel and teach about law and, and discipleship for months. It's just amazing how petty people are, you know. Uh, meanwhile, the person they were judging is back enjoying the fellowship again and totally free in the Lord while the other person is in bondage and bringing other people to bondage. Pretty annoying. Okay, I gotta go deal with the dogs. Uh, that's just my little gripe at the end of this message. I hope it was an encouragement. <laughs> Take care.